Esol, let's start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, second album's coming. <laughs> the no. second coming. What? Tell me about Esol as a, as a concept. I think, you know, I was actually working sound the other day. I think the first time I ever heard that word was my mate, you know, Rob, Rob Bright. And we were all sat in my flat as you are, getting cosmic at a weekend after electric chair. And we you know, were in that flat till Tuesday. And um, we were talking about all the soul boys uh, around the Norman Court, the older lot. And, were, and I remember Rob telling me this funny story going, it was a particular old school soul boy. He's very much respected in Manchester. And he went, you lot, you're fucking mad. You get so evangelical about all these um, slow records for your knees. And it's like, you know, when you're, when you're cosmic high and it's like all these, you get so evangelical. And the word e-soul came from being cosmic high on ease and listening to Phil Collins, a Brazilian record, anything that just was good, but sounded even better and more majestic. So it just came from slow, weird records at an afters. And it just, it, it was a bit of a joke because the old soul crew were a bit like, God, you lot are mad. And it just came from that. And I think it was, it reminded me of, um, I, you know, I guess it's the, the word Balearic could be a, 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 a applied as well, but it can, it just felt very specific to sort of staying up late over 40 years from when we were 16 and first going out till now, the present day when, you know, you were kind of like, you were high basically, but it was more than just hedonism. For me, sometimes, you know, the best bits weren't in the club. Sometimes it was after. Yeah, the afters. Yeah. Yeah, well, and what, uh, what you got up to then? Well, I, I mean, for me, it was, you know, it was just, there were very, it, it first started in Sheffield and going out. And I remember um, uh, we were in this pub, the Hallamshire, where I used to work, Hallamshire Hotel, and it was like where everyone went, the goffs, the punks, the casuals, trendies, as we called them back in the day in Sheffield. Um, sounds, just, like the, sounds like the Warriors. <laughs> it was, it was a bit of more, you know, they were all in there in those days. But um, I remember it was the first time I ever took speed and it was, uh, uh, there was a band called Chack and one of the guys gave me and, I, and I, it was the first time I'd ever heard house music at the same time on the same night. And it just sounded like the most unbelievable uh, fit. It was just like, it was like a revolution. It was like being born again. And so you stayed up late, obviously, invariably. And then it was, it was then that you just, you know what I mean? Other people's record collections came out. So it was just a series of moments, really, being in Sheffield at Castle Court Flats. And it's always referenced on the album as well, on, on the artwork. It was just, you know, what I call the 24-hour garage Unity, you know, you always go out, 24 garage, and you went met these mad people buying Rizzlers and chocolate and crisps. So it was more than just hedonism, because you come back and then you just share all these records, and they just sounded, uh, obviously your ears, your perception, your feel is so different, uh, and everything just sounded so incredible. And that was what, you know, Acid House, whilst I loved it, and I still do, one of the things that I loved of it most was just, it just opened a door to another whole layer of music. And also, it was a great time. There was, there was 20, you know, there was pirate radio arriving in Manchester and living in Hume. There was just these, it was just constant music um, all the time. And it was, um, so yeah, Esau as a, as a name, really, I think it was Rob Bright that adopted the term, but I, I just applied it to everything. So when, when you hear certain records that have the strings and, and that feel of sort of uh, spine tingle, um, it just, just became the name. Yeah, and, and, and how long ago was that? Well, that's probably 95, uh, but the term then became relevant from everything before that. Yeah. I, I was listening to Cabri Voltaire record when I was 15 or 16, or Simple Minds records, or Being Boiled, Human League, all these Kraftwerk records. Um, but that's, yeah, that's when the term came from. But then it just became everything, you know, and when I came to do the compilation, because it was a weird one in lockdown, uh, I just, uh, you know, you, you know the score, Instagram, waffling on, doing little videos of myself, um, proto-narcissist, and it was- I've not seen any of them. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
Josh Peterson hit me up and says, you need to do a radio show with us. We're doing this worldwide thing. So I came on there and I just spent literally every day and every night in lockdown in a two year period, just going from a record collection. And it's quite a, a strange cathartic process of just going, there was a lot of joy actually in that. And, um, but there was some real tragedy to it, just memories of, you know, losing my best mate and my dad. And so, and it just sort of, it just, it just it just opened up this box of memories of the last 40 years of my life and I just it, Mr. Bongo's approached me and said you need to do an album with all this and therefore the ESOL just became such a perfect thing plus uh, the cold cheer a bit the nerdy bit on back of every Brazilian record it's disco e cultura and I just love the the terminology so we just kind of nicked it <laughs> I, I love this. This is what this is one of my favourite shit. You know the amount of times that I come from um, strange ways, uh, the gay night in uh, the village when it was a proper working class gay rave. But it was really rough, but it was just full on edgy, sexual, mad. And uh, I always, for some reason, I always end up coming back here. There was always um, an end up on, well, I lived on Tib Street at the time, so I'd always come down back Piccadilly, because although it's the city centre there, it's, it's just quiet. And then this is obviously uh, the route to the roadhouse, which, as yeah. you know, it's mad, isn't it? Because this bit of Manchester still feels like old Manchester, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. What do you think about all the um, gentrification and all that? Well, it's a weird one. I find it double-edged. On the one hand, it it does. I think it does take away some of the soul. But on the other hand, it's just a. It's what happens, isn't it? It's ever an, an ever-expanding thing, and it just carries on. And it's now an international city. But I think you know. I remember someone saying, if Tony Wilson was alive today, he'd have hated the whole thing about the hacienda. You know, you just move on. Fuck where it used to be, it's gone, who cares? We just move on to the next thing. And I think it's the same with the city, it just changes like London. You've just got to find the new shit, uh, the new areas. And I think that's, you can't hold on to that, do you know what I mean? It just, that's like back to the ley lines thing, it just moves. Yeah. Hume's a different place now. And it shifts, doesn't it? Yeah. The magic shifts. Yeah. And it just goes somewhere else. And I think that's the, now that, funnily enough, that was the back end of the roadhouse and we used to also do a through those doors was the back of the roadhouse with our second room there there used to be a papa's alasia's oh look it's got the old sign i can't believe it <laughs> check that that's unbelievable so that was a laser cafe right and that's where all the old uh communist trade unionists used to meet and have brews and cups of tea and there's an old Greek guy who used to run it. He was a lovely man, big fellow with nice little red cheeks and all that. And he'd be serving you teas and you go in there. I used to sell the socialist worker paper when I was 18 on Market Street and you'd end up in Alasia Cafe. I've never, that's just been exposed that. Can't believe it. That's blown my mind that. Roadhouse, electric chair, 95. June 95, I've still got the first flyer which is pretty shit, but um, <laughs> basic. Uh, but yeah, like it? yeah, it was a fr friend of ours who did it, and uh, it was Trevor Johnson's brother, Craig, who did it. It wasn't shit, it was just old school, you know. And um, yeah, I just spent, I mean, it was the next part of the journey, really, coming to Manchester, living in Hume, and then this is where me and Justin started DJing properly after 10 bar, and the electric chair up and the Unabombers, and we would always take the guests, the DJ, back to my house, which is only over there, Tib Street, yeah. down back Piccadilly. And uh, I love this place, it, you know, but you, you saw about 300 people and the sound was immense because it was a live rock club. <clears throat> but it was amazing and I just, so many experiences here, Libertines played here, so many nights, Fat City, Grand Central. Even later on, like with Hoya Hoya and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And uh, Eyes Down. Mm. And, it's, you know, it just, I think that's the thing, it just continues on, but so much of the influence of the album, so many tracks got road tested here, you know.
This was Temba coming up, and this, believe it or not, was my first ever proper gig out in public. And uh, Temba would run a night called Deeper, which I did by myself. And um, it was a Wednesday night, they paid you 20 quid, and uh, they had a late license. And it was the first bar, of it, apart from Manus Dry Bar, where you could DJ. People, it's everywhere now, ubiquitous, but uh, at Temba, it what was- What year was this? This was 92 and uh, 93 and it was where all the burnish lot used to come in so in, in this one here this was it this was um 10 bar and what was the big tune then well it, there was so many but um don't know probably children at play larry heard was a big track there we probably play everything dub disco talking heads records and that the esol thing would really sort of this was now coming into a thing now with 10 bar and but it was a mad gaff you know obviously you know steph uh jake purdy uh martin strange brew moon but all people were DJing, DJing in there but all the burnish lot used to come in see it, all the gallagher's all people from india house and it was these one of the first ever alternative bars mantra got all gangster and rough and Bad house was happening everywhere. It all gone commercial. House had sort of got corrupted into this shandy fucking garage. Whitfield. Fucking don't tell me on Whitfield. People are actually <laughs> playing that again. I'm like, I'm not having it. Forget Blair it, you're not fucking playing it. And that was it. So 10 bar happened and um, it was a dream for me, buying records on Church Street, all these weird records. And then it was just back to that thing again. I'm not a collector. I'd find a record. For, I want to, and maybe it is an ego thing. I don't know, but I just want to share it and play it. I find it really interesting in, in, in the article, um, the, the moment in um, Barcelona when, when you had that epiphany with, um, and you call it Memento Mori, the, the quote. So can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, it was, it was only recently I was just uh, out in Barcelona and as ever now when I do gigs, I always go digging, meet the promoter and you always have food with them. It's, it's one of the joys of life, actually. Wander around the city, but they took me to... Um, uh, she was Irish and her boyfriend actually, and they took me to this little record shop just off uh, the Raval uh, in, in Barcelona, and um, just found this brilliant shop. I was just going through all the bins and just thinking, and I just had a real epiphany moment. It was, I was just something that um, a good pal of mine, everyone in Manchester knows this, one of our heroes actually, John McCready, said, had once, it, it, during COVID, he says, You do realise, Luke, all these records you buy and you spend 100 quid on discogs and all these records you collect, you know you just rent them. So what you mean, guys, they're all on hire. It costs you 150 quid, but when you die, it all goes back to the pot, you know. And <laughs> I don't know what it was, it just really struck me. It's an obvious truism, I know, but it really hit me that everything is on hire. Life too, you know, love, everything. And I just coincidentally just been reading... Um, I'm not that intelligent, but I think it was a, uh, on, on a podcast and it was about Marcus Aurelius and it was about Stoicism. And one of the central tenets of Stoicism was uh, the Latin memento mori, which is essentially we could die tomorrow, live life now as if you are, you know, clear your death as if you're going to die and enjoy it, grab it, live it. Um, don't lose the moment. You, you can change it. And, it, and it, it, it really made me realize that all these records you collect, it's, it, it was just one of them epiphanies funny moments and I was sat there thinking you know my dad passed away at 72 and I'm you know it's I think about how long left I might have and you think god what's the point of holding on to all this so the idea of sharing music and and and, and not holding on to it and has never been more important for me because I know it sounds really corny but it just it just really stuck with me that it is all borrowed, everything, all of this. And it's a compilation at the end of the day of other people's music. I've not made one of these records. All it is is a compilation, but hopefully you're adding something back to the pot because you, you know, this stories, listening to people's stories, where they bought the music, where they found it, I think becomes the thing that you're adding back to the pot. And I, I love compilations because I like hearing whether it's Bill Bruce or whoever, or talking to Paul Lapp, oh, I found this record here. And when I look back in COVID, it reminded me that Memento Murray and living it now, and I look back, I just thought of all these moments that had just happened, you know, um, traveling the world and going to, and, and this thing I also thought of was this whole concept of ley lines, which is, some cod science bogus term to talk about all these ancient root sites in England that they're all connected on like these lines, they're all built. But metaphorically for me, it made me think about there's all been these moments, explosions of creativity where 
all these people meet, like Sheffield, Manchester, Hume, where so much happened, you know. I mean, Hume itself is mad. You got, you know, um, just the maddest characters. Every artist, every DJ was there. You leave the Hacienda, you come on the Mancunian, if you get in a cab or you'd walk over normally, but if you did get a cab, over the Mancunian way, back from town, and you go to Hume and there'll be like the kitchen and all these late night acid blues, Billy Caldwell, um, all these cats, you know, over the years you've met, uh, Martin Prendergast, all, you know, John De Silva, all these people have been DJing and they're all congregating Hume. And I remember Manny's sisters, no, Manny's partners, Imelda's brother, told me this funny story. They're all from like Langley, North Manchester. They go, you go into Hume, he goes, it'd be they're dead mad. He goes, all these students and all these mad people, yeah. they're all, on Monday, they're still dancing around a portable television. Yeah. Oh, he goes, we well, just sat there, because these people are fucking mad. But yeah. Hume was a, you know, it felt like its own little ecosystem. And, and, and one of the reasons I always refer to it as a ley line is because you had everything. People like John Robb, the Inca Babies, every band, every DJ, um, but at the same time, it was a 20,000 strong, huge area, which was all this history. Mm. And remnants of it are still there, you know, um, like Kim by the Sea is one of the kind of, the outpost that still holds the flag up. Yeah, and I love coming back here. You know, there's a bit of nostalgia to that, but it's like, it feels like a little safe haven of the old world, just trapped in this little mini ecosystem, and I love it. But you know, I, I think um, I'll always remember it, Hume, because it's kind of where it was the beginning of staying up late all the time and listening to music. And it just sort of, it got so ingrained in my DNA at this point in my life. influx of people kept it moving 100 so, you know what i mean as well as all the like og hume bods as well yeah well, i think you know manchester's always been a city of immigration one of my mum lived there up in north manchester the jewish communities all you know bengalis everything you know yeah. even to this day uh, albanians and kurdish and it always moves and there's students coming here more than Sheffield, more than Leeds, more than Liverpool in a way. I think it's just a, a it really is a big melting pot and it always was, but now it's just full on. And I think Hume and, and Manchester in that era, there was no tourism, let's be honest, unless you're into Joy Division or United, no one came here. It was a scary old town and it was, uh, it was a rough and ready town, but there was a real beauty to it as well. And I think just some of the, the artists, the DJs and the culture that came out was amazing. Believe it or not, this was this gaff here, with the junction, um, was a mad old gaff, and this was to me. This is like this is where this is where I think the ley line is. You know, I don't mean there's actual ley lines. I don't, but it's metaphorical. Yeah, I know what you mean. But um, this was a mad old pub. We used to drink in here. You had all the Hume lot. You had the old Jamaican community, old Moss Side community, the Hume community, and it was just a mad old pub. And it's a shame now. Look at it. You know what I mean? It's just like, but um, yeah, it's like this that bastion of the um, the old world really Junction Hotel and, you know, and we were you know there was some there's some mad old characters and there's, this and there's a few left and you still get them in Kim by the Sea and I, and I love it um, awesome
Running